It's a great honor to be here and, and to receive this, this award, this honor. Um, but I, I picked this drawing uh, to go back and remember, like I was this afternoon, about all the things in Italy, all the importance uh, that Italy has had in my thinking. And this was a sketch I made. I think Paola Iacucci was in the studio when I made this drawing in New York in 1986. We were invited to the Triennale. And uh, I think this is one of, the, one of the first drawings I made, which was the sort of relation of the circular city of Milan uh, as a kind of gear moving Manhattan up back and forth somehow. And uh, this talk is a talk about time. It's, I love to give a lecture where I show one building in detail and every little part of it. But this is not that kind of a talk. It's a talk because it was organized one month ago. Uh, it's, I've only given this once, and that was in Chicago, about dance. And I want to start by where I left off in the last talk that I gave that I thought was really an important one. And that was in honor of Lebius Woods. <clears throat> so this, this point that I'm beginning with is a kind of homage to Lebius Woods. In Sigrid Gideon's book, this famous book, Space, Time, and Architecture of 1941, he argues for a new understanding of time in the Einsteinian spirit of merging time and space. He wrote the four-dimensional space-time creation of architecture, not merely for the eye, but for the entire organism, the experiencing soul. But what happened in education and architecture was a kind of backlash because and I, I, I think there were a number of writers, and we spoke about Charles Jenks, but Colin Rowe and Robert Slusky wrote this famous text, Transparency, Literal and Phenomenal. This is a diagram from that book. And it returned architecture in a way to two dimensions, to the flattening view of architecture. And this postmodern period kind of continued into this lack of connection to time. We built a project in Chengdu I'm going to show in a minute, but this project it contains Lebius Woods Pavilion, uh, which for me is really a work about time. He called it the Light Laboratory, but then the Chinese renamed it Time Light. And it's, it's a building, it's a, a place that you can occupy. These are some of the models. It's a four-story gap in a building we, we created uh, for three sections of art to be inserted. and he built this one and it's an amazing place with aluminum uh, polished stainless steel uh, in the gap all, all four sides the walls the ceiling and the floor and then this piece suspended and you walk inside of there uh, this is a piece of video oh we have no we have no sound on the video is there someone operating the technology here Basically, what I'm I'm talking about X Y Z and time. <coughs> Anti gravitational. The feeling of up is down. The feeling of down is up. It's an amazing piece cut into the side of this building, which, when you occupy it, you really understand the work and the and the and the sort of feeling, the vision of Lebius's work. And I'm really enormously excited that this piece of architecture got realized. I think one of the things that is spectacular if you get a chance to go there and, and, and visit the piece is it isn't just X, Y, Z plus T, which is when you move through it in time, but something else happens, and I would say it's almost a fifth dimension, and that is you lose your orientation because of the way the reflection works. And it's a spectacular thing. I wrote a book with Sanford Quinter and others in which I wrote a chapter on time. And in this book, this was from three years ago, I said there were seven types of time. And afterwards I said, oh, wait a minute, I'm leaving out the most important, the immeasurable. So I, I really wanted to go back and change that book, but it's already in print. It's hard to change a book after it's out there. Um, and then I started to think about this further for this talk because of the compression in dance. And so I decide that there are nine types of time. So I add a measurable time 
is number eight, the one I left out in the first uh, text. And then the ninth one, which I call compressed time, and that's about making architecture for dance. So the projects are selected to illustrate. For example, diurnal time, daily time. This slice porosity block was given the rule that two hours of sunlight must reach every apartment every day. Now the apartments that are on the adjacent block could only get two hours of sunlight if the building was sliced in this diagram and that's actually the, the zoning diagram gave the building its form. That's not an arbitrary form. Those are the lines of the sunlight that require the two hours of sunlight on the adjacent block. The building was built uh, for a developer from Singapore who wanted to build a, a shopping center with an office tower and a condominium tower, and we said no. We said you should make an integral urban form, a shape a giant public space, and I was lucky and that we had several other ideas, micro-urbanism, double-fronted shops, and I was lucky at that point that this developer agreed to follow our lead. We based the entire project's central space, three water gardens based on time, on a fragment of a poem. This fugitive between the earth and the sky, from the northeast storm-tossed to the southwest, time has left stranded in three valleys. And that was written in 760 by a poet, Tu Fu, the great poet, the Chinese poet who lived in Chengdu. The building is a hybrid building. I, I, I'm very dedicated in urban work to make hybrid buildings, not monofunctional buildings. In fact, we turned down a lot of uh, uh, invitation to do a monofunctional building. This building has everything, uh, shopping, living, working, um, and culture. That red line across is these pavilions linked on a cultural path. And it opened two years ago. Uh, 150,000 people came to the opening. I think this is a piece of video as well, right? There's a small section. If you go online, you can see the larger section of these videos. We've been using videos to describe our work. You can see from a distance that this is not a singular building, it's some kind of public, some kind of space is being formed. And this is the exit from the subway, so it's directly connected to the city. And the path of the sun during the day is, was key to how the plaza was formed. Ponds all have big skylights in the, uh, in the base of them, bringing light to the shopping center. And the fountains here is in cast iron with the poet Du Fu's poem. Another kind of time would be, I would say, seasonal time where the site has a particular quality that creates position for the architecture. And we did this project for the Newt Homsen Museum, the great writer. And it was above the Arctic Circle. 200 miles above the Arctic Circle is interesting because uh, in about two weeks, the sun will quit coming up. And it won't come up for, from the middle of December until the end of January. So there's no sunlight. It's just a soft glow on the horizon. And then during the summertime, it's up 24 hours a day. But this project, OK, so light and how the that diagonal light comes in, but this project is for this crazy and wonderful surrealist writer, Newt Homsen. And I, he wrote this, probably the first surrealist novel. In 1890, the novel was titled Hunger. And this is the inspiration of the building. Despite my alienation from myself at that moment, and even though I was nothing but a battleground for invisible forces, I was aware of every detail of what was going on around me. A big brown dog ran across the street towards the trees in the Tivoli. It had a small collar made of Mexican silver. Farther up the street, a window on the first floor opened and a girl with her sleeves rolled up, leaned out, and began polishing the panes. 
Nothing escaped my eyes. I was sharp, and my brain was very much alive. Everything poured in toward me. The women before me had two blue feathers in their hats. So this became, this building as a body of invisible forces became uh, the sort of concept for this museum, for Knud Hamsen, um, sheathed in tar-soaked wood like the Norwegian stave churches. And then the angle of the sun coming in, never reaching above 47 degrees, but I had a lot of controversy. <laughs> I mean, many, many articles against this building. And uh, actually, it was stopped. There were some 300 articles against the building in the Norwegian press. And, and so, but somehow the building wouldn't go away. It became so famous, um, maybe for people trying to stop it, it even made a, 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 a a tap and serve beer out of a model of the building in a bar. And, uh, but what happened was, okay, and also during that time, this woman teacher sent her students out to, uh, to sketch vernacular buildings in the landscape in Norway. And they all came back drawing the Newt Homsen building, but it wasn't built. It wasn't in the landscape, it was in the newspaper. That's the power of media. The children were drawing the Newt Homsen building. <clears throat> so what happened was, um, almost eight years later, I had a phone call from a man from Narvik who said, I really believe this building must be built. Newt Homsen is one of our greatest authors. It's this town of Hamaroy needs this building. It's a great cultural attribute. I'm going to the parliament in Norway, and I'm going to get this building funded. And I couldn't believe it, but he achieved it. And then the problem was, uh, and th this is the great light, but the problem was they decided it had to be open on Newt Hamsen's 100th birthday, which was August 9th, and that was only 17 months away from the time that the money was uh, given to build the building. There's the, there's the last sun, which, which is coming up pretty soon, the last sunset before that winter. So the th this is another thing about time. Imagine a building that took 15 years to realize, but then they had to build it in 15 months in order to reach the date, August 4th, 2009. So they made three shifts, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, and with construction lights, of course it's dark anyway, they built it and it, they finished it very beautifully, very beautifully built on August 4th, 2009. Another a question is the time it takes to conceive a design. How long will it take? Depends if you're satisfied, but if you're not satisfied, like what happens to me, look at this, look how many there's over 30 different designs here. You see them all changing. Each one of those has plans and sections. My studio was going completely ragged. <laughs> when are you going to stop? Stop. Stop. No, no. It just kept going, 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 going. So many schemes. So many schemes. In fact, we filled a whole room with the models. <laughs> but finally, we, I said, I like this idea of light that, that's a kind of laminar light. And I, okay, one of the reasons it was so difficult is I was adding to a building I had built 10 years before, this the art and art history building in Iowa. So by, by adding to your own building, you have a kind of crisis. That, that's, that's one of the reasons it took so long. But I'm very happy we didn't try to imitate the original building. We made something new. We said the, the original building had horizontal, porosity and it was planar and this building would have vertical porosity and it would be laminar in section so that these courts of light these multiple centers of light would bring light into a very large building it's 140,000 square feet of art art history ceramics sculpture painting many different departments and those are some sketches of the multiple centers of light and I'm very excited, it's, it's nearing completion, it's another six months away, but you can already feel that this is really working, the, this creation of the condition of light. It's basically a concrete building with these multiple centers of light with a stainless steel uh, skin that was made in Germany. And this building was built for like $500 a square foot, very economic building. But the quality of light and how it comes into the art spaces is very important. And in the center, you can walk through the building. You could take a shortcut through the building to get into the university campus. So everybody is encouraged to walk through. 
and that space is nearing completion now. So this is a very exciting project. But I won't go into detail. I want to focus on different types of time. A duration of from the beginning sketch until a building opens, that can be, you know, students get uh, bored if we give a project for 13 weeks. They say, oh, can't we have two projects? 13 weeks is nothing, you know, I mean, how about 13 years? My average project takes eight years. So I've been doing this for 40 years now, and I, we did an average. So from the first sketch to the realization, the average is eight years. This one will be, will be 10 years. And this, the campus at Princeton University, and they're the original sketch models, December 8th, 2007. To break down, there's a performing arts, uh, 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 there's a orchestral rehearsal, there's dance rehearsal, it's a building of the arts. And we, we, we made it into three buildings connected by a forum. So theater and dance, music, arts, and a forum this yellow part, which was w what we added to connect the three parts. That way we could make the building smaller like the original buildings at the Princeton campus. And each building has another idea within it. For example, in the music building, there's the suspension of the individual practice rooms over the collective practice room. And in the dance building, there's the idea of a thing within a thing. And in the poetry building, there's the idea of something being embedded. So it's like three projects and everywhere the concrete structure is will be very thick Lecce stone, stone from a quarry in Lecce, which, thanks to Paoli Acucci connecting me to Lecce, um, is, is going to be in Princeton. This building will have this amazing. Uh, proportions uh, are a part of all my work. You know, the, the Fibonacci series, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, that never gets old no matter how many computers you have or how many digital this you have, proportion stays. The idea of being able to see the activity as you pass through the campus of the dance going on, that's the forum, which will have a, a, a sheet of water over it, so this light will be speckled light from sunlight. And there's this concept of the individual practice rooms being suspended on rods over the collective. That's the collective pra uh, orchestral practice room. And you can see these wooden boxes are on suspended rods. So you'll be able to see through the glass this curious condition of the pr uh, suspended practice rooms, e even glowing at night. And, and therefore, it forms a, a campus space. It's really a quadrangle on the Princeton campus. And already it's interesting. You can see that that's the building where these suspended uh, cabinets will be hanging. So the structure spans the whole distance in the, in the wrong direction, counterintuitive. And there's the embedded, and there's where the dance. Inside the construction shack, there's a clock. You see that? 591.05.44 by seconds. It's going to be 591 days until this is finished. So 10 years, and now I get this countdown clock. I can just go there and watch you know, the time go by. It's really exciting, you know, when you worked on something for that many years to see it come out of the ground and, and to love it. You never, I don't want to change it. I think it's very important to work on architecture without looking at the current trend or styles because they pass like fashion. And when they're gone, I hope your building doesn't look like what passed. So I try not to look at too many things and try to make the building really about that place. Cyclical time, cyclical time and linear time. Like the Greeks, the reason the Greeks perfected architecture is time wasn't linear like our time. It was a cyclical thing. So they could perfect what they were trying to develop over time. Time, time would move in a cycle and various things that they, they developed got stronger and stronger and stronger in this cyclical movement, which is the opposite of our, our necessity to have something new every you know, fashion, it's like new every, now it's like every three months or something. It used to be fall and spring. Now they, So I think this, is, this kind of meditation on, on cyclical time is an interesting thing, and that was we were adding to this Greco-Roman 1933 building, and our, our building wanted to be, in a way, 
somehow the sort of antithesis. So everything there was stone, everything was enfilade, and everything was heavy. So I said, our building could be like a feather. So where we have the heavy, they have the light. Where we have the, the, the bounded, we have the unbounded. And it was a complete contrast. And the, the rule was you were supposed to build on the north side where that pond is. That's where all the other uh, competitors were supposed to build. Ando built, uh, put his scheme there and all the other five that were competing against us. But I said to the jury, I said, I had the courage not to do what you asked because in your facade, it's inscribed in stone that the soul has greater need of the ideal than of the real. And they believed me. So we won unanimously, and this is one of, uh, one of the buildings I'm most proud of in terms of, if you get a chance to go to Kansas City, the Nelson Atkins building, and I, I won't go it in detail, just that all those golden sections and the proportional rigor is in there, and that the heart of the building is what I call breathing tees, which bring the light in, but also hold up the lenses and feed the HVAC, HVAC system. And they flutter to bring warm sunlight in on the north side. On the entrance plaza, there's a great work by the artist Walter Di Maria, One Sun in 34 Moons. And you can see those kind of ghosted moons when the, when the ice is frozen. But this brings light down to the parking garage below in a very amazing way that, that sort of moves with the sunlight. But it also, through the seasons, through the time of the year, changes drastically. And there it is in summertime and in wintertime. It has this fantastic ice. And at night, the glow of the moon's coming the other direction. A similar project for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, which we just broke ground for last uh, month, three weeks ago. And here was a project which was also a competition against Snowheda and Tom Main. It was a long process um, of a competition. But again, we broke the rules. They wanted to build a seven-story parking garage uh, because the church, there's a church there in the, in the center, had a parking lot and the charge was to relocate the parking of the church before we could build the new building. And I said, you shouldn't build a parking garage. What you should do is think about this as a campus. You should, you should tear down the Glassell School and put parking underneath the whole site and build a new Glassell School with a roof garden, extend the Noguchi Sculpture Garden, and then the new building would have these seven water gardens. So the, the idea is, instead of just following a kind of program of building a parking garage, that you would have a bigger vision and, and do this much more. Of course, that meant that we were going to have two buildings. And this, in a way, is a building about sequence in time, because the original building is from 1924 and is stone and classical. And the Mies, this is the only Mies van der Rohe building uh, a museum that he did in America. And that's from 1954, and it's transparent steel and glass. And Moneo did a 2,000 stone building, and so our building would be a translucent building. There's the original Mies building, um, which has spectacular spaces. In fact, you know the National Gallery in Berlin, that's really that horizontal space. This is the one time Mies actually shifts the floor plane, and you get this kind of rom plan on the inside. So it's, a, it's quite a spectacular work by Mies. Very simple. And our building that's right across the street is about the sky, is about the big Texas sky, the clouds, and the possibility of a luminous canopy, that light could come to all the galleries as the gallery roof is just partially warped to bring the light in, to slide across the curve and then the building itself is wrapped in what I call a cool jacket. Those are very large tubes of glass. So when the hot Texas sun hits the side of the wall, the air is, by chimney effect is sucked up the wall and we reduce the solar gain by about 
that also gives us a glowing light to the galleries and a glowing light from the outside. That was the first sketch of the cool jacket around the concrete building. And the galleries, a simple flow, a simple orthogonal galleries for art, but then with this luminous canopy. And now we're in the stage where the director is requiring exactly 25 foot candles, so we have, using all the technology available now, we can actually orchestrate and test the light along the walls to be perfect. And seven gardens organize the space, so uh, you'll never have museum fatigue, you'll always be able to see these lush tropical gardens. So there you see the Mies building, our building across the street, and the glass cell, which is now under construction. This, this building is the new school, which doubles the, the size of the glass cell school. From, and it's all made out of pieces of precast concrete, which start with this inclined plane, which leads to the terrace of, that overlooks the whole campus. T taking that angle and adding operable windows, creating studio space, very tall, 16 feet. And so it's simple precast. That's the structure, that's the skin, and that forms the, the studio space for, for the glass cell school. There's a forum as you enter where the students can exhibit their sculpture. And there we are two weeks, three weeks ago. That's the whole team at the north wall of the building. It's just started to be constructed now. Duration. The long-lasting duration of architecture, I think it's fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, we talk about the arts, all the different arts. I mean, the last section is compressed time. Dance maybe d is the shortest duration a kind of condition of 20 minutes. Here on Noxos, and I just saw this for the first time this summer, on Noxos, Greece, there's the Gate of Apollo, which is made out of Noxos marble, giant, giant sections. And it's interesting that in the 1800s, the French occupied Noxos, tore away all the marble and rebuilt d d uh, various things. They couldn't take this down because they couldn't, they, w they were too big, these pieces were too big. And they just stand there in the wind. I mean, it's an absolutely stunning thing. It's a very mysterious thing. How did they lift those? And the fact that, you know, you know kind of cultures later couldn't take them away. I think it's the, this idea of duration. And also the idea of something that was so important that didn't last very long at all, like the Crystal Palace, 1851. I think it was up for six months. It's like a fair, you know? It's like the expo. It's there and it's gone. I did like one expo pavilion, by the way the one for Bahrain, because you could take the pieces and put them back in another place. That was my favorite pavilion. But anyway, and I think it's an Italian architect, right? Yeah, anyway, we can do that in the questions. But, but it was rebuilt at Peng Commons, and, and there it is again. So it, it was taken down, moved, and rebuilt. So it had another life until it burned down in 1936. But what an amazing moment in the, in the history of architecture, Joseph Paxton. Architecture can last very short. We built this in ice, blocks of ice, oblong void space. as part of the snow show, 2003. It was built in November, December, and then it melted into a pool of water, nothing left. Just light and ice. There it was in January, and then in March, Nothing, just water. Idea, the idea of life, you know, the, the fact that we're all limited in our time. It's, you know, we're here for a little while as architects. Just when you get going, you, you're too old, you die, right? That's what happens. Finally, it takes so long. I mean, a dancer, their life is over at 40 because they can't dance anymore. But an architect hasn't even had a commission at 40. I'd never had a, I mean, I built some little, candle shop or a little showroom or something but so I thought about Scarpa because I, I thought about this great place and I've been there a couple of times and I love this oops I'm going the wrong way I love this fact that when he died he had already planned to be buried out just outside the wall wrapped in linen like an old knight standing up I think this is a very interesting detail we were thinking about Scarpa when we're working on this necropolis. This is a place 
a city of the dead. There are 10,000 people buried here now. It's the most popular burial place in China, in Taiwan, I'm sorry, in Taiwan, which is not China. And we're building the, uh, the Oceanic Pavilion, which is all about burial urns and the arrival hall. And there you can see the, d the little light blue, that's our section, but all of this already exists. So it's already kind of a necropolis, a city of the dead. It's like a metropolitan with different areas. And, and it's funny, but the client, this old guy, he lives there in this, 100 people live here, 10,000 people are buried here. And I was thinking, you know, I had a hard time starting this. I had another, I won't show you, I won't bother you with the 30 schemes, but we did that again. And, uh, but I came back to a circle that the sort, of, the sort of idea of the cycle, the cycle of life, the circle has a kind of universal, I, the idea of a circle also has, it can be, it can be centripetal, centrifugal, it can be, it, you can find a way to move through it. And that became a, a sort of the condition of the Oceanic Pavilion, but also then we brought the kind of main entrance hall into this condition of these spheres that intersect. So what, what I was working with was the intersection of spheres, which is something you can do quite easily now with the digital technique. So the language is not like a classical circle at all. It's the intersection of spheres and their consequences that became the nature of the project. And that became something spatially very exciting, which I think you wouldn't probably conceive it without the digital help that it's very easy with a 3D printer to intersect these spherical shapes. And then it has this view of the Pacific Ocean. So there's this feeling of infinity, this sort of horizon. Another local time, site time, I'm on my way there tomorrow morning, for the Maggie Center in St. Bart's, a cancer center, a cancer care center for people with terminal cancer to come. This is the, the oldest hospital in Europe, I think, St. Bart's, and it's adjacent to the St. Bart's Cathedral. So I was thinking about how do you make a space that's connected to this site that has some soothing quality, and I was thinking about music. And back in the time of St. Bart's Cathedral, there wasn't musical notation as we know it. The monks had a thing called shape notation, or nooms. So these these are very interesting diagrams of nooms or shape notation. So I wanted to alert, kind of allude to that 11th to 13th century noom notation. Floating colored glass in a, a sort of staff and then making that on a concrete frame. So there you see, on the left, you see the basic concept of the building. There's this kind of noom notation in a sort of staff of glass. And then there's a concrete frame that holds the building up. And inside of that, there's a bamboo inner layer, which gives warmth and acoustic privacy. So it's a thing within a thing within a thing. And from the outside, it the glow is very special because we came with a new technique. And that is we use this sort of uh, high energy. It's like polar bear hair between two panes of glass. It's hollow. It's called Okalux, something we've been using because of the energy uh, potential of it. And it, it has this soft glow. But we discovered that if we slice the Okalux, you could put a layer of film color. And they do that in the factory. And it's like a Mark Rothko painting. So this is something I'm very excited about. There's a kind of view of, of the interior of bamboo. Another local time, site time, I would say, would be the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts <clears throat> in Washington, D.C. The, you know, the thing that's, this is an extension of an existing building, but I think it's very important because the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial are static buildings. Buildings with a, a statue, a columns, a step. The Kennedy Center is a living memorial. That means it's all about the activities that go on there. So dance, performance, opera, and this becomes kind of key. So there's a giant Edward Durrell Stone building, and our building, we put it mostly underground and brought the pavilions up to shape views. 
So there you see the Edward Durrell Stone Building, which is, I think, the largest performing arts center in America. It has like, I don't know how many theaters. And our building it becomes these pavilions which shape space. So they're in white concrete, and there's a river pavilion, there's a glissando pavilion, and an entrance pavilion. And this now is under construction. But I won't go into detail, I, I just want to say I think this particular project is really related to the fact of a living memorial for JFK. So the, the activities that go on here become the primary catalyst. Like the River Pavilion has jazz festivals, music, and, and, and connects to the Potomac River. And the simulcast on the Glissando Pavilion allows you to free come and see an opera where people are paying $150 a seat on the inside of the Kennedy Center. They, other people can sit out on the lawn and see that same opera in real time simulcast on, these, on one of these pavilions. So it gives something back. The immeasurable. That's impossible to talk about. It's like Brock. He said, the most important things in art are precisely those which we can't discuss. So the immeasurable is something you would try to achieve. I think in a chapel, we tried to achieve in the chapel of St. Ignatius, seven different bottles of light in a stone box with a thinking field reflection at the foreground. And each of those bottles was like the spiritual exercises of Jesuits in which there's a reflection and then there's uh, the, the student, the novice, and the reflector. They, they speak back and forth, these spiritual exercises. So as an analogy to that, I was thinking of complementary colors. You know, when you look at a blue rectangle and you look at a white piece of paper, you see a yellow rectangle. Or if you look at a red rectangle and you look at a white piece of paper, you see a green. So these were organized in complementary colors, each, each of these seven bottles of light. And it pulses when the sun, as it often does in Seattle, when the sun is the cloud goes over the sun, there's a pulse. And this pulse you can feel inside the chapel. It's really alive that way. And then cast glass also picks up. Many pieces of the building were done in, in cast glass. Another, I would say, relates to the immeasurable in the sense of the ocean the oceanic. The concept for this Biarritz Ocean and Surf Museum, it's something that Mayor Barotra of Biarritz made up. That was also a competition. I'll tell a little story. We went to the competition to present it, and there were like five or six contestants. And, you know, they're all, you know, we're last in the lineup. And we're all kind of, Bernard Toomey comes out all dressed in black, it's into a limousine, he leaves. You know, there were a lot of heavy duty people. And my ex wife at the time was from Brazil. And this is a museum about the surf and ocean. And when I get to present the building, I say, first of all, I know about surfing because I grew up in Seattle. And when I graduated from high school, I surfed every beach from Seattle to Mexico. And I had a picture of me with a surfboard. And then she said something about Brazil and surfing in Brazil. And then we presented the project. And then the mayor followed us out of the room and he said, you were last, but now you're first. <laughs> it was an interesting process. And the concept was very simple, that the building would somehow be the feeling of oceanic under the sky and under the ocean. And the whole building would fit in that. And I mean, the thing about the ocean also, it tells us something today that we didn't know. It's not just the infinite and the horizon. The ocean connects us all. Every current in the ocean is connected to every other current. This is something we've only realized in the last 10 years. And it can take as long as 900 years for the water to reach the other side of the earth. But the water of the earth is all connected. I think it's a metaphor for us. We're all connected to each other. There's no nationalism. It's about the earth and humanity. It's all, it's all interconnected. Anyway, that building was really about shaping a view of the ocean horizon. So we tipped it up on one side and turned it out to the ocean on the other side. So this is the, the city side. It tips up a little bit. 
you rise up, but when you get into the, oh, that's the below, that's under the ocean, under the sea. There's not a single thing on that curved ceiling. You know how our ceilings are always like full of garbage and stuff like this ceiling. There's not a single thing. So that, that ceiling becomes a spiritual thing just by having nothing on it. You know, the, Hervé Descartes did the lighting and, uh, oops, and then, I'm sorry, I don't have the proper slide. It tips, that's the tip side to the, to the city. It tips in the other direction to the ocean. So you see this infinite horizon. And that's also the use of Oakland. And then the sunset and the way this whole building kind of relates to this sort of long oceanic horizon. I'm doing an experimental project now, uh, which is part of a, a, an ongoing thing that we've been working on for about two years now, or a year and a half, called Explorations of In. I think this goes back to the Pantheon, which I said earlier today. So the, my obsession with light and with inner space, not kind of architecture as an object from the outside, but about the inside, and that's the transformative space. So the manifesto says, to study architecture freed from the purely objective. From origins of architecture we explore in. In, all, spaces, all space is sacred space. Architecture of in dominates space via space. Intrinsic in is an elemental force of sensual beauty. In is useless, but in the future will be used. Purpose finds in. And the thing containing is not the thing contained. All these aspects were built in models, uh, studied in different scales, uh, models of concrete, models of wood. I think Lebius Woods would like this project. Where are the Lebius Woods of the future? They should be someone out there willing to take exploration as the path of architecture. I think that's something we're lacking today. So. It's interesting uh, work, and, but we said, now what are we gonna, we had worked on it a year and a half, so where are we gonna go from here? We have to move it into some kind of reality. So we did two things. We accepted the invitation to do Tesseracts of Time, which is a dance, stage sets of dance, and we decided to try to build a house out of this study. So you see there on the left, the four intersecting volumes, the four intersecting spheres. This, pro this project would take me one hour to present, so I, I apologize. The second is the inversion of that. That is the spatial inversion, where you're just looking at the interior, not the object. The third is the insertion of a tesseract. The fourth is the insertion of the inversion. And the fifth is trying to make it into a house. So this house is just a 900 square foot house. It's in, the, it's in a preserve. We it's a piece of land that was going to be divided into five suburban houses that we joined again. We bought, there was 28 acres, they could make five suburban houses, terrible. Saving all the trees, we joined all the land, that took a year, and just put one tiny house in the middle, which is only 900 square feet. So it's really about a rural preserve, and, and that's just a wooden house with these five intersecting spheres that kind of collide, and now we're just, it's, it's there, it's already there. I'm sorry, I don't have any good pictures. But the space is, has that energy. So the last section, number nine, is compressed time. And this, this project, also by the invitation of Italy, by Francesco Del Col, invited me for the Palazzo del Cinema competition, keeps influencing me throughout my career. I'm very proud of this project. We worked on it for nine months. And it's about cinema time versus our time of life. So, and there was, a, there was the view of arrival because you came by Vaporetto from Venice into the lagoon that this building formed by, by the cinemas hanging over this, this lagoon arrival hall. So I think what's really interesting about cinema is you can take an event that took 10 years and collapse it into 20 minutes. Or you can take an event that took two minutes and turn it into a two-hour film. So cinema time is like an accordion. And then you have the diaphanous time, which is where the water is somehow changing your experience of time, and that's from the lagoon. And then you have the absolute time of the sun, and let's say, like in the Pantheon, a slice of light. 
So these cinemas were like accordion time, collapsed in this bottle frame. And, and then below you have this diaphanous time of the arrival below into the lagoon. And then you have this condition of the absolute time, which doesn't really exist, of course. Now we know it. Now, after Einstein, absolute time doesn't exist because it's merged with space. But I think that the sort of, let's say, the compression aspect of this. So the last project is the theater. The, it's just it debuted in Chicago on the, on the 6th of November. It's coming to New York. Hopefully we'll come to Europe. And we made, <laughs> Jessica Lang came to us to do this. It was in uh, collaboration with the Biennale, with Sarah Herta in the Biennale in Chicago. And she said, well, what, what, you know, and I said, well, what if we made it really about architecture, a dance for architecture? There's four types of architecture, under the ground, in the ground, on the ground, and over the ground. We could do the whole dance in four movements, each one five minutes. She agreed. So basically the whole project, you have to, it takes 20 minutes to see it. I don't have a film of it here. But what's really interesting is the, the ex explorations that we were building in models, because of green screen technology, we could occupy with dance. So she choreographed how they could move through these exploratory models. Some of these models are only this big, but with green screen technology, the second uh, phase of the project, they were dancing in our spaces, which was spectacular. And then the last, it was all black and white, the first three movements. And the last movement is like a burst of color. I don't know if any of you have seen that film, Andrei Rublev by Andrei Tarkovsky. It's like it's a fantastic film in black and white. It goes on, and, and then in the last three minutes, it turns into this burst of color, which is absolutely an emotional thing. So I described that to her, and she said, "Yes, let's do that with our." So it's all black and white for the first three movements: five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, and then the last movement it became color. And we made these fragments of these tesseracts in scrims. And these are, this is some of the tests going on. And they, f at the end, they fly out of the theater. They're jacked up, you know, they can pull them up on. So anyway, that's my talk for today. I uh, open for questions. But I think, you know, when you think about time, in the end, I had seven when I started. I needed to add number eight, immeasurable. And now I'm adding compressed time, but there's probably more. Thank you. <laughs>